The Habitable Worlds Observatory is a space-based telescope that plans to directly image Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. It's set to be around about the same size as JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. But instead of observing in infrared wavelengths of light, it'll instead detect visible and ultraviolet light. Now its orbit will put it at the stable point Lagrange point 2, just like JWST, around about 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And the plan is for Habitable Worlds Observatory to be serviceable. So just like the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around Earth was serviced by astronauts, this is set to be serviced by robots this time. I chatted to Mark Clampin, the director of the astrophysics division at NASA, about the plans for this project, and that interview is coming up later in this video. But don't get too excited because Habitable Worlds Observatory is not due to launch until the 2040s. So how come we're talking about it now? Well, every decade, the National Academy of Sciences in the USA partners up with researchers in the astronomy community to write what's known known as the Decadal Survey for Astrophysics. These reports assess the status of the field and then identify like what the committee that's been gathered to write them believe to be the most important science goals to focus on in the next few decades. With that in mind, they then recommend what the next generation ground and space telescope missions should be, and NASA then uses that to decide what actually gets funded. So some of the biggest observatories in the world have all come out of the Decadal Surveys. So in 1972, the Decadal Survey survey recommended that a large space telescope with ultraviolet visible and infrared capabilities be developed, which became the Hubble Space Telescope, which launched around 20 years later in 1990. Similarly, in 1982, the recommendation was for an advanced X-ray telescope, which became the Chandra Observatory, which eventually launched in 1999. Then in the Decadal Survey for 1991, the recommendation was for a Space Infrared Telescope facility, which became the Infrared Spitzer Telescope, which launched in 2003. Then going into the millennium, the Decadal Survey in 2001 seems like it discovered that different fonts exist. Papyrus! but also stated that understanding the early universe was the biggest scientific goal for the next few decades. And so their top recommendation was to fund the proposal for the Next Generation Space Telescope, or NGST, an eight meter infrared space-based telescope to detect the light from the first stars in the universe, which became the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, which eventually launched 20 years later in 2021. This is how long these space-based missions are in planning and development for. So if we want a new observatory in the 2040s, we have to start thinking about it now. But before we get to that, let's complete the picture here, because in the 2010 Decadal Survey, the recommendation was the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, known as WFIRST, which has now become the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, set to launch by 2027, with its focus on understanding dark energy, i.e. the thing that is causing the expansion rate of the universe that we still don't really understand. Somehow, I've never made a video on the Roman Telescope, so if you'd like to see that, let me know down in the comments below. Which brings us to the 2023 Decadal Survey, which was a little delayed due to COVID for obvious reasons, but was eventually published last year by a committee of experts working across a wide area of topics in astronomy and astrophysics. Their main science goal that they said we should focus on in the next couple of decades was the discovery, study, and characterization of habitable exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy of billions of stars in the Milky Way that have atmospheres that could potentially host life. To achieve that goal, they recommended development and funding of a large, about six meter in diameter, infrared, optical, and UV telescope with high contrast imaging and spectroscopy. What's now been dubbed the Habitable Worlds Observatory. It's actually the merger of two proposals, one called Louvoir and one called the HabX Observatory, which you might have heard of if you do read or consume a lot of astronomy news. Now, the idea is to use Habitable Worlds Observatory to search for what's known as bio 
bio signatures in the atmospheres of these exoplanets. These are essentially molecules that would be the markers that life existed on that planet. Now I've made a whole video before on what those molecules could possibly be if you want to check that out. And I made that video because Jada Breast T is also searching for bio signatures. So you might be wondering, well then how is Habitable Worlds Observatory any different here? Well Jada Breast T is a telescope that was built specifically for observing the distant universe. That was the main science goal. And the exoplanet community essentially managed to piggyback on the project so that they could actually do the science they wanted to as well. What it means is that the instruments on board weren't designed specifically for your science case, so you kind of have to make do with the limitations. So to study exoplanets with JWST, you have to wait until a planet passes in front of its star from our perspective here on Earth. Then you can observe what happens when the starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere. You can then split that light from that one tiny patch of sky through a prism, so you get a trace of how much light of each colour or wavelength you receive. And then you can find out which wavelengths or colours of light were lost because certain molecules that were present in that planet's atmosphere like to steal away those specific wavelengths. The downsides of this though is that you have to wait for each planet to pass in front of its star before you can study it. So if you want to study an Earth-like planet that, you know, orbits its star at the same distance as the Earth does from the Sun, taking around about 365 days to make one full orbit, then you have to wait around a year every time that you want to do this. And you do have to do it multiple times to be able to get a strong enough signal. You add each observation together. So this ends up being much easier with JWST when you have a planet that's orbiting much closer to its star that only takes like days, weeks or months to make one full orbit so that you can do it repeatedly. But then for a planet to still be habitable and orbit much closer in towards its star and not get cooked like Mercury does, then the star also has to be much smaller and cooler, something like a red dwarf star. But now there's a lot of evidence suggesting that red dwarf stars possibly aren't the best place to look for habitable planets because red dwarf stars also flare a lot, giving off a lot of like high energy light and particles that can completely strip a planet of its atmosphere. So then how will the Habitable Worlds Observatory be different then? Well, the plan is to have what's known as an IFU, an integral field unit on board the observatory. So that'll be one of the instruments on board. And so with an IFU, you get an image, but also at every pixel, you get a spectrum of the light. You can think of it also like an image at every single wavelength or color. Habitable Worlds will also have what's known as a coronagraph that blocks the light from the star, revealing the much fainter light that's reflected off the planets. That means that not only can we take a direct image of the planets in orbit around their stars, but also you get a spectrum of the light that's interacted with the atmosphere of that planet so that you can work out what the atmosphere is made of wherever that planet happens to be in its orbit around its star. To do this though with Earth-like planets, the contrast you need is incredible because the smaller the planet is, the less light it will reflect and the fainter it will be. So the contrast you need to be able to detect Earth-like planets means you need to be able to detect things 10 billion times fainter than the brightest thing in your image. That kind of technology just doesn't exist yet. Like we can reach contrasts of around about like a factor of 10 to 100 million or so yet. So there's gonna need to be a lot of investment in that area to make sure that this project can actually achieve its goals. In the same way there was for JWST as well, for all the non-existent technologies that were needed for that when it was first proposed in the Decadal Survey in the 2000s. But like with JWST that was designed for one thing but it's been a benefit to the entire community, the same is going to be true for Habitable Worlds Observatory as well because it's not just exoplanets that will benefit from having an optical telescope with an IFU in space because these kind of instruments already exist on ground-based telescopes and my research relies on using these to study galaxies but because we're limited by the Earth's atmosphere the resolution is poor so space space will allow us to study galaxies in this way as well with optical and UV light. Now while the decadal survey recommendations are usually picked up by NASA who've now committed to funding this project with a budget of less than 11 billion dollars there most likely will be some buy-in from the European Space Agency maybe even the Canadian Space Agency again and also the UK Space Agency 
as well. There's a lot of talks ongoing between the UK Space Agency and NASA with how they can get involved, but perhaps it might be like a single instrument on board the telescope again in the same way that the European Space Agency did with MIRI on board JWST, which the UK was heavily involved with. Now there's a long way to go with this project and clearly it all depends on like future funding decisions, so there's no guarantee at the moment. But if we want to see this project get on the ground, then we all have to get involved at this early stage. So as academics, we have to get involved with clearly outlining the science goals and as members of the public we have to get involved in convincing governments the US, UK, European, Canadian governments that this is something that they want to fund and a project they want to be involved with in the future. So to that end academics including myself have already signed up to NASA's working groups. Now these are the science groups that are going to be considering the science goals in great detail and then the technological advances that will be needed for the project and then advise on what like the best strategy is moving forward. So I'm really excited to be a part of one of those working groups but also as a UK astronomer as well thinking about you know the UK space agency involvement thinking about the UK playing a bigger role in one of these great observatories is really exciting especially because those UK astronomers might get our hands on some of the first data as well if that was the case. Now if you're really interested on how you actually get projects like this off the ground with like 20 years of planning then you're going to love this interview that I did with Mark Clampin, the director of the astrophysics division at NASA whose job it is is to decide and then manage which projects get the go-ahead. So uh, the role of Director of Astrophysics is very broad, so I'm responsible for all of the research and analysis programs that we undertake uh, in support of NASA's astrophysics missions. I'm also responsible for long-term strategy, so every decade we get the National Academy's Decadal Survey, and I'm responsible for thinking about how we actually set a strategy to implement that within the context of the whole program. And then finally, um, finishing the program of records, which is the last decadal recommendation. So in my case, it's making sure that we complete Roman and get it launched on schedule. So let's talk about Habitable Worlds Observatory. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about what the Habitable Worlds Observatory will give us that's different to what we've ever had before? In astrophysics, we're in a place now where Webb is doing really amazing um, science, doing spectroscopic studies in the atmospheres of um, exoplanets. But we're really just doing the transiting planets, and that's a relatively small fraction of the planets that are out there. So we're kind of not looking at the largest fraction of exoplanet systems out there and I think as we look at the next step in how we move forward in the search for life outside our own solar system the decadal felt it was important to start looking at solar type stars mm. and really you know get away from that sort of selection effect and one of the ways you do that is by starting to do direct imaging which mm -hmm. of course brings a whole series of challenges, you know, beating down the light from that star mm. and then being able to image so close to it at the same time is very challenging. Mm. And so how will habitable worlds do this better than, say, JWST? So if you look at the chronographs on JWST, most of them can achieve contrasts of around um, 10 to the minus 5. Mm. And for instance, to see the pale blue dot around the nearby star, you're talking about contrast levels of 10 billion. Right. So you, the bottom line is you can't suppress enough light from the central star mm -hmm. with JWST, and you just can't get close enough mm -hmm. to the um, central star to be able to reach the planets, mm -hmm. not the least because you're working in the near infrared with JWST. Yeah. So going to the visible makes things so much easier. Mm -hmm. And we need to go about a factor of 100 times more stable with the telescope that we are currently with JWST, oh. which I should say is really knocking our socks off here, just how stable it is. It's just sitting there rock solid at a few nanometers over weeks. Mm. So. And so is, is getting that more stable and getting that contrast, is that something to do with the coronagraph or the telescope itself? It's both. It's, yeah. There's an interplay between the two. So we need a chronograph that really delivers the raw contrast to the order of 10 billion, and then we need to hold the wavefront error going into the chronograph really stable at the mm -hmm. tens of mm -hmm. picometer level over the um, control cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's a very challenging problem. Yeah, so it's going to be all hands on deck for that chronograph yes. in the next couple of decades. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it'll be exciting. It will be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited to see you know, what technologies come out of it as well. So obviously, with your big picture hat on as Director of Astrophysics, what do you think will be one of the biggest changes 
in sort of how we how we do astrophysics or you know in the next decade so i think one of the biggest changes will be how we work with data mm -hmm. so we're just at that point now where we have missions that are generating what you know everybody calls big data right so euclid is starting to do these big all sky surveys yeah. in the us we're planning to fly roman in 27 and one of my big concerns now is how do i make sure that Roman data is not only available to everybody, but everybody can work with Roman data. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear to us already that you can't just download Roman data onto your laptop and do, do science the way we've always done it. So we have to find a mechanism that's equitable for the whole community so that people can work with the data in, in a way that allows them to get their science done. And what we're doing is thinking about how we establish um, uh, so on NASA Science Cloud, but also how we establish access to the NASA cloud with the computing resources in the cloud so that you can basically work remotely on the data without ever having to bring it down because the costs of pulling big data in and out of clouds are really prohibitive. And a lot of the science that we see people doing now is just becoming very exclusive if we don't find a way to make it accessible to everybody. So I think that's one of the really big challenges. And one of my challenges is making sure that we're ready for Roman to mm -hmm. do that. That was Mark Clampin, Director of the Astrophysics Division at NASA. A huge thank you to Mark for chatting to me there. Obviously, I had to cut our interview down a little bit from its full length to fit it into this video. So if you want to watch the full unedited version of the interview that I did with Mark, where we chat about how you even become Director of Astrophysics at NASA and the career path that he took from university to where he is now, then that full video will be posted on my channel later this weekend so look out for that so you don't miss it. Now if you've watched that interview and now you're perhaps wishing that that could be you in the future or you can be involved with the Habitable Worlds Observatory in some way but maybe you're at the start of your career path or the beginning of your learning journey and you just don't know where to start then this week's video sponsor Brilliant should be able to help. Brilliant is a learning platform with interactive lessons across science, maths and computer science designed to be uniquely effective. They're First principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up. So each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that let you play with concepts, a method that's been proven to be six times more effective than just watching videos of lectures. Plus all the content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Now Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data analysis, all of which uses real world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions. It's perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis skills with everything from like Bayes theorem to multiple linear regression. Learning a little bit every day with lessons like this is one of the most important things you can do, whether that's for like personal growth or like professional growth along a career path. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the description. And if you do, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription with Brilliant. So thank you so much to Brilliant again for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. This is how long these space-based, space-based missions, space-based missions, space is hard, but it's harder. Molecules like to steal away those specific wavelengths. I don't think it was a motorbike, but it was something noisy. So buying all your antique cars, people. Noisy. <laughs> Old man shakes fist at the sky. <laughs> Why still singing along? So I leap from the gallows as I find a biosignature. Crash the spectrum as I something 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 basically the aliens are screaming who's afraid of little old me that's where that was gonna eventually go if my brain had been switched on anyway where was i just throwing my ipad about the place now because i'm just so warm Blah. in detail and the technological advan technological technological clamp in the director of the astrophysics astrophysics you think i'd be able to say that one because it's my own job